So I wanted to welcome you all here tonight. This is our first uh, storm surge program um, of the fall. We had hoped for a program last month. However, we just couldn't get our speakers coordinated well enough, but we're continuing on. And this is part of, unfortunately, only a two-part series, but uh, I think we're gonna cover all the bases. And tonight, uh, we're gonna have Chris Raya, who you all know uh, lived through Hurricane Sandy on a barrier, trapped on a barrier island. And uh, through his stories, I'm hoping that we can maybe gain some insights into what that might be like, and that should be of interest to people who live in a coastal community such as ours. But before I get on to uh, having Bill Sargent introduce uh, Chris, I just want to take care of a couple of house housekeeping items. Uh, first thing is uh, we have another program coming up on December 2nd. And that is focused a bit more on uh, Newburyport itself and our vulnerabilities as a coastal community. December 9th? 7th. Yeah, December 7th. Sorry. <laughs> there were a couple of dates floating around, but it's the 7th. And it'll be here in City Hall at 7 o'clock. Anyway, so we're going to be focusing on the vulnerabilities of Newburyport specifically, and we'll have uh, various departments from the city um, uh, here to talk about that and how the city might react to a uh, storm such as Sandy, for example. Um, so we hope you can make that. Uh, the other thing is uh, we tried to modify the sign-in procedure so it wasn't so cumbersome and people backing up there, so we gave you little pieces of paper. Um, obviously, if you've, you're already on our mail list, you don't have to fill an email address or anything, but maybe put down your name and some comments about the program that the forum might ask for and just turn them in as you exit. And Sharon Curry will, will collect them right there by the table. She's waving. And then I'd also encourage you to visit the, uh, the Solarize New Report table. The, there's a deal worked out uh, with the city. Um, and uh, there's some great programs there if you're thinking about some alternative energy for your house. Uh, so now, without further ado, I want to introduce Bill Sargent, who spent some time with Chris Raya following Sandy. And uh, Bill, why don't you come on up here? Thank you, Mike. Uh, please excuse this very subtle tie. Uh, I actually, I, I got this, I was supposed to wear this for the last speaker. Uh, if you remember, George Buckley was here, uh, and he and I have done a lot of work with horseshoe crabs. So I got this special tie, and I ended up in the emergency room. So I didn't get to wear it. So I'm wearing it tonight in Chris's honor. Um, and uh, I do, I, I don't mean to self-advertise, but I have another book uh, that's coming out, and the title for that is Plum Island to Palm Beach, uh, Our Sinking Shoreline. The last chapter uh, is I'm being escorted out of Mar a Largo. I won't, I won't tell you the, all the details. You'll have to buy the book to find out the details of all of that. Um, and Chris uh, is, is the main character in, in uh, a couple of the chapters uh, in that book. Uh, I was hoping to have it to show you tonight, uh, but it's still in production. It probably should be ready uh, in, a, in a couple weeks. And um, so basically, what, what I did is, uh, uh, and this project really started with, with Yankee Homecoming. And I bumped into uh, Don Cheney, uh, who was a friend of mine from Ipswich. I had met him when he was taking some, uh, his students from Northeastern uh, down onto the marsh. And we became very good friends. I hadn't seen him for a couple years, but I, but I uh, bumped into him for Yankee uh, Homecoming, and we had lunch. And um, and he started telling me about this new boat that he has. Uh, you know, it's a 43-foot uh, cruiser. Um, and I'm a great believer in in uh, OPBs. I don't know if anybody that knows what that stands for. It's other people's boats. Uh, uh, <laughs> saves you all the, the, uh, the hassles of taking care of it. But, um, so I threw out this idea of wouldn't it be fun for, you know, a science writer and a, and a marine biologist to travel down the East Coast looking at, at the, re the results of, of Hurricane Sandy. Um, and uh, Sandy Tilton found uh, out about this uh, idea, and she said, well, you have to get in touch with Chris Chris Raya, who uh, uh, you know has a really incredible, and I think the, the best story that I've heard 
uh, about, uh, about Hurricane Sandy, uh, and I won't step on any of, of his lines. Um, but uh, the first thing that, uh, that Don and I remembered when we, when we met Chris is he said, well, now we're in the epicenter of, the, of, of where the storm hit. And we laughed at each other because every other community that we had talked to in New Jersey had said exactly the same thing. But, but uh, Tom's River really was uh, the epicenter uh, of the storm. So I just uh, want to say that, you know, uh, Chris was fantastic. He brought us uh, all to all the places that he had been and, and uh, gave us an incredible tour. Uh, he's the kind of cop that you want to have uh, to save your life, and as he's in the process of saving your life, he's going to tell you a few jokes. So that's the kind of cop that you want to have. Okay, without further ado, Chris. I should have prepared some jokes for tonight. There's one already. All right, so about me, uh, I was born and raised in New Jersey, um, uh, up in Ringwood, New Jersey, way up in the mountains, far, safe away from any sandy issues and, and water issues. Uh, moved down to Tom's River when I was about six years old, five, six years old, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, I have a brother, he's a fireman. We're the only uh, firemen and, and police officers in our whole family, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. Everybody's like, oh, you're related to these people and whatnot, but it's just the two of us. Uh, he's still volunteering. I retired about a year and a half ago. Uh, reluctantly, I didn't want to, but uh, unfortunately, due to economics and, and the wonderful state of New Jersey, uh, it made more sense for me to retire and actually go back part-time with my police department. So I'm in a really, really good place. Um, I was in law enforcement for 26 and a half years. Um, I started out as a park security officer with Tom's River. Back then, it was Dover Township. We had an identity, identity crisis, I'm sorry. Um, I ended up getting involved with their auxiliary police program. I was with them for six years. Uh, I also worked for Seaside Heights Police Department as a special. Went through the police academy, got out of there, got a cop job out in Burlington County, which is how I met Sandy Telton. She was my uh, court administrator 21 years ago. So we've known each other a little while. Um, but stayed there for two years, Barney Fife type town. I was a chief, I was a sergeant, two patrolmen. We had one car, you had to have your own gun. It was, it was interesting. Um, but obviously seeing the light, I took tests and got on Tom's River, which is really where my heart was. Uh, worked there for 17 and a half years, and again, I retired February of 16. Um, during that time, I did work a number of hurricanes and nor'easters. Uh, I've witnessed a number of uh, storms come through, and they've ripped up the boardwalk, and what do we do? We Rebu rebuild everything. Um, that's just the nature of what we do. We overcome and, and keep going. Um, my police department's one of the most trained police departments in the state. Uh, pride ourselves in that, and thank God, because I honestly think that training helped me get through that night. Um, go to the next slide. Again, this, this slide is actually from a few days later. Storms can bring beauty. Gorgeous. <clears throat> this is our town. We're 44 square miles. I got a chance today to go through Plum Island, and since we're so large, again, Plum Island, from what I understand, is about 11 square miles. You've got ocean, you've got bay, obviously we have a little bit more of a bay, but all that western portion of the, uh, actually I'll show you, all this portion here going straight up is marshy. So it's very marshy there. Again, you have a lot of marshes here. So it's very similar uh, in regards to what we, we have and what we went through. Um, we are the county seat of Ocean County. Uh, our police department, this is back at that time, we employ 600 employees. Uh, there's a $100 million budget that we have, uh, again, 44 square miles. Yearly, we have 95,000 people about, uh, fluctuates a little bit. We're now the eighth largest city in New Jersey. We were the seventh. Uh, neighboring town uh, took us over, which actually I'm fine with. Uh, summertime, we do swell to 150,000 people. So a lot of people come down, vacation, uh, they'll rent a house for three, four thousand dollars for the week and, and have a blast. Um, we have 12 square miles of waterways. Uh, nearly 40,000 properties, uh, mainland structures we have about 30,000, and Barrier Island structures about 6,500. Police Department, at that time we had 144. Uh, we are up to 166, which is our full complement right now. Uh, we have EMS, our first aiders. There's 16 full-timers that are paid, and we have 26 part-timers. Uh, again, this is going back. We have a little bit more, a little bit less. Um, communications Department, we have 18 full-time. We have some part-timers now. 
Uh, our auxiliary police program has probably right now about 20, there's about 30 officers back then, and they were a great asset. Uh, they helped out with a lot of traffic lights that went out so we could do our job. Uh, again, volunteer EMS, we have another 60 members. Uh, volunteer fire department, 300 members. CERT, uh, these community response teams, there was 100 members of them that went out. They were a great help. We have three high schools, three middle schools, 14 elementary schools, and 180 school buses. Those school buses became very important as we went through this storm. Numbers, $40 million in damage. Um, that was 20% of our tax base was wiped out. Um, 14,236 structures were suffered damage were destroyed. We lost an ambulance, three fire trucks, six police vehicles. I was one of them. Uh, two firehouses and one first aid building totally lost by the storm. One was on the beach. Nearly all our electrical, gas, water, and sewer systems were destroyed, so we had to replace them. Uh, basically, when the storm hit, they turned off the electric. They turned off the gas because worse things could have happened. Um, unfortunately, when you turn off your power, the pumping stations for the sewer pipes turned off too, so and they had water coming up through the pipes, and that caused a whole other uh, mess on our hands. Um, There's about 60, 675,000 cubic yards of storm debris that was removed. That's 33,750 20-yard dumpsters. It's a lot of trash. We had these uh, stations set up throughout the island and on the mainland where they would literally just separate it through big machines and spinning stuff and just chewing out metal and uh, concrete and, and dirt and stuff. Uh, over 1,000 residents and non-residents passed through shelters. This is Sunday the 28th. So this is before the storm hit, well before 24 hours. The building I'm standing on right now, and I'm going to point out, you see this little dune system here? I'm going to point that out later on. Just remember that, okay? You can see the emergency dune system that they put up, basically just mirrored what was there. That was already getting washed away. Um, <clears throat> this is view. Again, looking straight out the ocean, looking to the north. There's a little video. I don't know if you can hear it or not. Oh, sorry. Here's my pointer. There it is. So pretty, pretty extensive. Can you hear okay? Is that okay? Um, so now we're on top of a building there. It's a lifeguard headquarters. So it's three floors up, basically on stilts, and then two more floors. So we're outside on this deck. It's supposed to re, re, uh, be able to um, sustain a two or three category hurricane. It didn't. This wasn't even a hurricane when it hit. By the time it, you know, it had downgraded a little bit. Uh, my day on the 29th, went to work. Um, prior to going to work, I was at home securing everything that I could. Um, lawn furniture, we have these decorative stars on the house, making sure the fridge, freezer, everything's filled up with water, freezing water, batteries, lights, you name it. I, I Again, I was in survival mode, more or less, and just had everything kind of ready for my wife and kids that were at home. Uh, 1.30, we had lineup, and uh, they kind of briefed us on what was expected. Uh, they were off a little um, because it was a lot worse than it, it was. Uh, we had areas for shelter set up. Uh, they did send us over to the beach, and everybody was kind of like, really? And there was a guy over there already, but they sent us over. Uh, and being I was a beach guy for about 12 years, they trusted me and another guy over there. Uh, we were in one car. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so my supplies that I bought from work, uh, I had three flashlights, I had food, I had water, you name it. You know, I knew I was going to be in it for a bit. Uh, I didn't anticipate how long it was going to be, but uh, I prepared for the worst. Uh, cell phone, extra batteries, whatnot. Uh, after lineup, we went over, uh, started heading over to the beach. At around 2 o'clock, we got a smoke condition at a Wawa. Who knows what a Wawa is? i got to ask that. All right, great place, right? It's like a 7-Eleven, but on steroids. Good place. Um, so we headed over there, and it ended up being a uh, heating and air conditioning uh, system, uh, something with the, the uh, belts had burnt up. So we're all there, fire department's there. They closed the Wawa, but people were still knocking, trying to get inside and uh, wanting to buy coffee or whatever it was. People were still out and about looking around, which they should have been home. Um, 
Right after that, around 2.30, maybe a quarter mile down the road, it was a fu house fire on Gary Road. This fire was being fueled by the, the this, this solid driving wind. It wasn't really a rain event, this whole storm. It was all wind and flooding, obviously, but the, the driving force was this, this just wind blowing all the time. And uh, we arrive, we see the side of the house where the electrical panel ties into the lines, just burning up the whole house. It was going right up the side. Fire department gets on scene. They did what they could do. Fire got uh, more or less a hole of the house, and that was it. Um, they were able to maintain that house and, and didn't spread to any other houses, thank God. So on 3 p.m., we leave there and we go over to Pelican Island. So Pelican Island is a maybe a quarter mile from Gary Road to the east. There's a large bridge that goes over. There's two bridge system. One's an old draw bridge, the Mathis Bridge, and then there's a big tunny bridge, which boats can just go under. Um, we get over to Pelican Island. It's a small island on the way over to Barry Island, and we see this. Now again, this is at 3 p.m. on the 29th. 8 p.m. was when this was all gonna peak, right? So we see wires down already, poles are down. One of my other officers are fire guys coming back over. You can see on the left side of the screen, there were poles there, there's all wires down. Uh, the roads were already flooding. Uh, we were already having issues with all the side streets flooding up. Um, and it was just getting worse pretty quickly. Um, so while we're over there, we get dispatched to this, this wire. Remember that picture before where I showed you, watch where these dunes are, okay? We were sitting on a down line. Nobody's around. It felt like a bunch of, you know, numb nuts. We're sitting there like, what are, we, what are we doing here? We're watching this wire. Nobody's supposed to be here. So we're sitting there, and next thing you know, you hear boom, boom, boom. We hear, we hear all, all this noise along the beach and we see waves starting to crash, like on the other side of that dune, and you can see this, the, just this big spray, right? So as we're sitting there, we see, um, again, this is all the side streets, we see this. We saw it burst through. This is the beginning of the breach. So it's one, two, three, four. Just boom, right under that. Well, what did we do? We backed up, right? So <laughs> smart cops, right? So we back up. You can see all the water starting to flow through there. And it's just, it's just getting worse by the minute, literally. Um, water started flowing west into the roadway. We left the area. This is my first phone call to my supervisor. I told him what was going on. And there were supervisors that said we shouldn't have been over there. Again, experienced officer. I expressed what we should be doing. We should be getting off there. And he says, nope, Lavalette PD is staying there. They have their own police department. You guys are staying there. Go check them with them. All right. So we start heading. Heading around, we see some more roads. This road is um, Sixth Avenue in Ortley Beach. If you go, if you're familiar with this area at all, right at the end of the road, there's a building. Just to the right of there is a surf club. And a surf club, this is like what Bill was saying, was saying in his book. So all these people from Staten Island come down. They, they use their glow sticks and they have a good time and dance and drink and do all kinds of stuff, right? This place, every time there's a nor'easter, Basically, the water comes from the ocean because it's built on top of the dune, goes out the front door. They take a squeegee, squeegee out the rugs, and they open for business. It's just a common practice. That's what they do. Um, and it's been going on for, for a very long time. Uh, this is where things start getting interesting. All right, so we check in with the OEM, we, or Lavalette OEM. We explained to them what was going on. Um, and we started, well, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to ride around some more. There's nothing else to do. We're not going to sit, you know, in a building. Um, so we start driving around, and uh, we end up going to uh, some side streets, and we hit Fourth Avenue, and we see two to three feet going across the roadway. Now Fourth Avenue goes east to west. We couldn't get out the way we came in. So already at, at 4:30 we were stuck. So what do we do? Call my supervisor and explain to him what's going on. And he says, well, why don't you try to get out through the Manila Looking Road uh, bridge, which is north of there. It's up. They got hit really hard, too. Um, if you're familiar with our area, we have Orley Beach, Lavalette's its own town. We have Normandy, Chadwick. Then it goes into Bricktown and then Manila Looking Bayhead. So we're trying to get out to that bridge. So we start heading north, and we're driving in the northbound, and all of a sudden there's all this water all over the place. And we're like, well, what do we do? Well, two lanes going one way, two lanes going south. We went to the south, line, the south side. And we start going north into southbound lanes. And as we're driving, we're looking around, we see these lagoons. And the lagoons were super low. 
like to the point where boats were sort of teetering on their hulls. And then you start thinking, wow, this is, this is interesting, you know? You always hear about tsunamis, not that this was a tsunami, but you always hear of that sucking action of that water getting sucked out. The water was going the right way, the wind was going the right way, the tide was low, all right? All that water was now getting stuck out in the ocean, and that tide was gonna rise. So we kept going. We end up uh, going to a place where Route 35 southbound, again, it's a two-lane roadway each way, it's separated by a median. You could see the water hitting the fog lines, the white fog lines on the sides of the roads. I'm like, huh, this is interesting. Kept going up. Route 35 and north and south peak to this point, and then it's a one, one lane each way, roadway up that way. We look up ahead, see it's dry. We keep going, we're in a clear, this is great. The bay's low, what, what could go wrong, right? As we're heading up there, we get a phone, we let the dispatchers know, and they said, you know what? Go back down to Lavalette and pick up your one victim and his dog. So we turned around, jetted down there, picked up the dog and the, uh, the victim, threw him in the car, and within, within 20 minutes, we were back at that same spot. Now water's on the center, center lines. So now you went within 15, 20 minutes from the fog lines to the center line of the roadway. Well, we figured out we're gonna be fine. We're leaving anyway, who cares? We start going. We get up to the point where that road meets again. It's dry again. We keep going. About 800 feet later at Downer Street, it's a traffic light just before, maybe two blocks before Manor Looking Road, where that bridge comes in, there's three foot white caps. Appliances, debris, the windshield got hit with a two by four like this, sound like somebody threw a rock at the car. We stopped, and you know those movies, the scary movies where the, the camera kind of draws back, and we all went, did one of these. Even the guy in the back seat's like, what did I get myself into? You know, I got this guy and his dog in my car. So we quick turned around, I floored it, we go back. Now, that area where it was just maybe 10 minutes earlier, where it was touching that center line, was a foot of water. So water is screaming in now, all right? So we go back, we're heading down south, call my supervisor, who was now concerned, a little, you know, a little worried now, now whether he had a lot on his plate or whatever it was, but uh, now it, this was real. We were really, really stuck over there. We had no choice to get anywhere. We had to go back to Lavalette. So that's what we did. Go back to Lavalette OEM, to their fire department. Their fire department is basically street level. We park our truck right in the back, uh, in the front of the bay, go walking inside. Hey, we're stuck, you know, what are we eating? You know, at this point, right? So we're making burgers and we're eating and the victims are eating. They've got five people, whatever it is. There's, there's four cops, there's me, my other officer, um, I think four firemen, three first aid personnel, um, dispatcher, and like I said, five victims and of course, the dog. So we're kind of hanging out there and around seven, seven o'clock, one of the guys goes, you might want to move your truck. And we go outside and it looks like somebody turned a fire hydrant down, on down the road. Water's flying down the road. So we take our truck, we park it in the back lot, foot higher, and uh, it sat there. We went inside and we're sitting there, again, eating our cheeseburgers, kind of hanging out, nothing to do. We can't help anybody. We're, we're dead in the water literally at this point. And uh, about 7.20, 20 minutes later, water starts coming in the fire department bays. And the first thing I noted was, where do those drains go? Is this a closed system? Is it part of the whole, you know, is it going to just dump outside? They said, oh, no, it's a closed system. I said, okay, so it should hold for a little bit, right? And I'm like, yeah. Within five minutes, we were shin high in water. So now I'm grabbing portable radio batteries. You know, we're grabbing bags of toilet paper just in case because we had to move now. And my officer and I both said to OEM, we said, you know, why don't we move to the school? That's about a block and a half to the east of us. But it's a brick building, it's fortified. They just had a food drive and there's bathrooms. There's plenty of room. It's like a no-brainer, right? Just put people in a boat and we'll go. Nope, we're going 30 feet to the west. I said, in that first aid building? And they said, yeah. I said, okay. It's about two feet higher. They have a generator. Oh, okay, they have a generator. So that's what we did. We were overruled, it was their town, that's fine. Me and my partner were a little upset, but we gotta stay together. So that's what we did. And in about 15, 20 minutes, we got everybody over in that building. Uh, I was one of the last guys, uh, one of the last two trips going over. And as we're pulling in that bay, what's coming in the back bay? Water. So this water is, is really increasing very quickly. Survival mode kicks in, a lot of training. What do you do? We need blankets. 
I know we have a generator, but we have to still think of worst case scenario. The blankets are in the bay, in two feet of water in the garage. So I put on a pair of waders, went out there, grabbed the garbage bag, filled it up with everything that I could find that wasn't nailed down, bring it inside the building. So now here we are again, waiting. So I remember calling my wife, and I said, well, this is what's going on. <laughs> you know, we're stuck over here. I had called her earlier in the evening to just give her a heads up of what was going on. And, uh, you know, obviously she wasn't too happy. I wasn't too happy. I was actually kind of annoyed because we shouldn't have been there in the first place, but it is what it is. It's my job, you know. So uh, I hung up with her, and I said, you know, I'll call you around 8, 8.30 when the storm comes through. They're saying it's going to peak. That's going to be the end of it, and we should be in, you know, we should be golden at that point. She's like, okay, no problem. She had everything set. They didn't have any power. The kids were a little freaked out. Uh, fire alarms were going off in the house. You know, it, it, was, it was tough on me because I couldn't do anything, you know. Um, but obviously she understood. So now I was watching this bench in the back of the building, the first aid building and be about this high, you know, and water would creep up. And by about 8.30, it was going down again. I'm like, great, we're good. Using it as a marker, fine, we're in the clear. Call my wife, we're good, got food, we got power, right? We're fed, we had an Alzheimer's patient, that was one of the victims, so we had to watch him the whole time because Alzheimer's patients in water doesn't really mix too well, so he kept wanting to leave, unfortunately, so that was a, a bit of a trial, but we were okay. We had bathrooms and plenty of toilet paper, plenty of toilet paper, plenty of blankets. Uh, we were okay. So we're kind of just hanging out. The worst part of that was the 911, the county 911, they get all the 911 calls. So somebody calls and needs help, goes to the county, then they send it to the towns. Lavalette had 911 patched into their cell phones that they were going through like candy because the batteries were dying to try and field calls. And we were getting calls from people who didn't leave, who didn't listen, because they'd been through this, or I'm not moving, or whatever it is. And we couldn't help them. Stuck in the erratics. Stuck in the second floor of the houses. Water's coming in the house. This is not, you know, what we had trained for, to listen to these people just, you know, and tell them that we couldn't help them. We were supposed to help them. We couldn't. We were straining ourselves. So I'm watching this uh, bench again. And I see it creeping up again, around 10.30. And I'm like, what the heck is this? So this whole time as we're watching this water come up, you can see, if you, I don't know if you heard about this or not, but Camp Osborne, anybody hear about that? It's up by Manloking. And it was an old, uh, like they leased the land, a 99-year lease. They put these little homes on them, a little summer community. That's all it was. It's just summer. Went on fire. And it was all gas. So you could see the whole sky just glowing. Just the craziest thing, right? Again, not much rain. It was wind. So now we're like, all right, water's coming up. Let's keep an eye on it. 1.30 a.m., what did we lose? The generator, a precious generator that we moved 30 feet away from and two feet higher from is gone. So now we're in the dark. The water peaked around 1.32 o'clock, and it sounded like you were in the hull of a boat. That's how close this got, within an inch. We sandbagged the doors. Uh, water was literally lapping at the doors trying to get in at us, and we couldn't do anything. By 2.30, the water began to subside, thank God, all right? Uh, let me just go through my notes for a second, sorry. So then the next morning, right, daylight, start, daylight starts coming around 6, 6.30, we wake up to this, two to three feet of water. That's two roadways. You can see right here, that's the back of the building. There's a roadway that goes through here. There's a little island here, and then there's another roadway, and then the bay is off to the left of that picture. That's a parking lot, two roadways, and a beach. Two, three feet of water. Uh, this is towards, again, towards that school. Uh, there's a water tower there. Just off to the left of that water tower, excuse me, is, where's that, is where that school is. Rainbow. Isn't that a kick? <laughs> right? After the storm. You get a rainbow, but and we all kind of laughed about it. But um, right through here, there's a playground. Again, this is just a little bit more south of where the back of the building is. 12:38. And I remember before this, I called my wife and said, "Well, guess what happened last night?" You know, and she was, I was really ticked off because number one, we shouldn't have been there now. Number two, we should have been in that other building. 
and we weren't. So now we're stuck. She's like, well, when are you coming home? I'm like, I have no idea. I have no idea. I honestly did not know how bad it was because we, they, they were giving us calls. I'm like, I'm turning my radio off because I can't help you. And I turned my radio off. I said, call me by my cell phone. There's nothing we could do. Um, we heard throughout the night that one of the piers in Seaside Heights one, went and broke down. Uh, the one in, in Seaside Heights, uh, in Seaside Park, I'm sorry, went down. Uh, ended up being both of them got destroyed, partially destroyed. Um, I'd hop on Facebook throughout the night, still here. You know, everything's okay. And my friends were like, oh, my God, you're, I can't believe you're over there. You know, how, how did this happen? Everybody prayed for us. Uh, but, again, we were, we, were, we were dry within an inch. So state police show up, 1259. Their boat is literally in the parking lot. They drove right across the beach, right across the parking lot, right across the road, right up to the back of the building. So it turns out the guy with the vest on, he, his... Uh, son goes to my daughter's school, so he and I are buddies now, you know. But uh, he and one of my neighbors basically saved me that night. <clears throat> so here we are. We're on our way out finally after a few trips. And our Alzheimer's patient, who was also diabetic, started going into shock. So now we notify our dispatchers on the mainland where 37 and Fisher Boulevard hits, which is basically the, the second light in from the bridges where it was dry. They had an ambulance, paramedics, everybody was there ready to take this, this poor guy. And we were ready to do CPR on this guy on a boat. In driving wind, we couldn't go fast because there was so much garbage that had gotten pushed over from the ocean through the, the, all these houses, cars, you name it, was in there. Um, we ended up unloading here. We couldn't go over to the mainland because there was so much stuff in there. This is the view from uh, where we unloaded. Again, you can, you can almost see the water lines here of how deep it went. Uh, I found out later on that they tried to rescue us at 11 p.m. the night before through this area in one of, there's another video, uh, one of these videos, uh, one of these vehicles, I'm sorry, these two and a half ton military trucks. This thing was getting tossed around like a, a, a toy. They started and they had to abandon it. So two o'clock we hop on this truck this is Pelican Island. That's a deck. I don't even know where it came from. There was debris everywhere. There was wires everywhere, telephone poles. You name it was in the road. You can see there's a bus up there. I guess they were evacuating people. That got stuck at some point. I mean, whatever, the amount of time it took for this water to come through was amazing. Again, this is driving out. You can see people walking on the median up there. People tried leaving during a storm. And you saw that red truck before, sinkholes everywhere. Telephone poles. Now, these are the poles that were down pretty much the night before. You know, when we got there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Just amazing, really amazing destruction that, that occurred over there. So, the aftermath. Let me just get up to my notes here, I'm sorry. So this is coming over the, the 31st. So basically what happened was the 30th, once we got rescued, uh, my captain, uh, who was over there, who was my supervisor, uh, hugged me. And uh, he didn't sleep that night, you know, but he was glad to see me. My chief was there. He drove us back. A number of our friends, uh, my friends that were in first aid, fire, they were all there. They still couldn't believe that I was there, but they were there. And, of course, I get a microphone shoved in my face here, talk to CNN. That was, that was fun. Uh, but I did. You know, we were a little exhausted. We didn't get any sleep. Um, again, this is where you saw that picture before. Sinkholes. These people were try either driving around or were actually trying to leave. This is on Route 35 uh, going northbound in Ortley Beach. Just to my right, which is what Bill had said was sort of the epicenter of where this storm hit, that's where it hit. All right. Years ago, water has a memory, right? It used to be an inlet there. And people ask me, I'm like, well, how do you know that? I'm like, well, there's the Cranberry Inlet Marina. <laughs> it's really not that hard to fathom. And that's about where it was, all right? There was also uh, inlets, and that was back in like the 1700s. The 1800s, it was one up by Manilukin Bridge. Look what happened there, all right? Personally, I think they should have just built a bridge over the barrier island and left that open, which would have cleaned up that bay area, but that's a whole other money political mess, I guess. Um, 
houses everywhere, wires everywhere. Um, there was a house that traveled on the beach. All right, so, so say this, this right here is the ocean. There's a street in from there. There was a house mid-block, traveled down this road, across 35, down the middle part of where 35 and 35 South meet. There's a block there. Across 35 again, and land in the middle of a road, intact. And everybody said, where did this house come from? Where did, this is, we had to go in a house and find out. We found mail inside the house that came from five blocks over and a block in. Back then, they didn't strap that many houses down because these were old summer homes, which I've seen, you know, we went to Plum Island today, saw a lot of those today too. I'm sure some of those aren't strapped down. They're not secured right. Um, they were just ripped off the, off the foundation and our houseboats just floating all over the place. This is the old lifeguard headquarters. Um, this was basically an old house that had gotten donated to the town. That was, if you looked up, see where that, that tree is on the left side? That's where that house was, just past that. So that whole house, it was an old bricks that all came down, floating around. And 35 North, I mean, there was debris everywhere. Now, again, this is the day later. This is after they cleaned up a little bit. Because I, I had to go home and get some sleep and then come back. Uh, this is Fifth Avenue in Ortley. Uh, this is actually where my wife and I met, uh, not far from here. Her uncle uh, has a house there, and his house got destroyed. I uh, went to his house, and, and the house was intact. It was an older house, but there wasn't a thing in it. Windows were taken out. Backsides of the doors were taken out. Like, the refrigerator was just gone. I didn't even know where it was. Um, this is, again, Orly Beach. If you look right about where this pointer is, that's where that lifeguard headquarters was. Gone. There's the, lasagna, the lasagna noodles I talked about, right, in the, uh, in the newspaper. Looked like leather or lasagna noodles. All the roads were like this up on the oceanfront. Amazing. This is the surf club down here. That was decimated. And right about here is where that road was. Remember I said 6th Avenue where all that water was flowing from the surf club? That's that road. This is under the boardwalk. Right about here, I want to say, was more or less where the road was before the storm. So all this sand, there's my mouse. All this is gone, about six feet of sand, gone. You could sit down all, on, all those side streets and look right out to the ocean. There was nothing there, gone. This here, uh, that's, that stanchion there, that's part of the, and they, they go down like every other year because they keep putting these, uh, these stairways onto the beach and we'll get a good nor'easter and knocks it out and they just replace it. Um, but that's, that's about probably eight, 10 feet of sand gone. You can see how flat it is. The infamous Seaside Heights Boardwalk. Um, you can see the, uh, the coaster that everybody seemed focused on. This is the tragedy of, of Sandy. No, that's not the tragedy of Sandy. Um, it was impressive. Uh, again, this is Ocean Terrace. This is up in uh, Ocean Beach 3. This is a very small community. Uh, every house was like this, that blue house. There were all these small houses. Guess what's there today? Not a whole lot of small houses, right? What do we do? We build it higher. We build it bigger. And that's what happened. This is on the bay side. Again, the water flow went right over 35, north and south, went right into that harbor and eroded that whole edge. Again, Ocean Beach Street with those houses, little, little salt box houses. We ended up taking pictures of these and, and I remember we're walking down, down the road not there. We're in this area, I guess it is. And we hear this hissing sound. It was a gas line, three-inch gas line. And we're walking around, what's that noise? And the, you know, cops are pretty smart, but what's that noise? You know, you would think it would hit you. And then we realized, because you smelled it, and, uh, you know, we kind of hightail it out of there pretty quick. Uh, this is November 5th. You can see the water line on this. Now, this is Harding Avenue. This is about two blocks north of Vision Beach, which is really where a lot of the damage was done. Uh, it's just south of that area where I had mentioned I saw that breach occur. 
All right, so you have that breach occurred here, and then it just branched out. Everything to the north or the south of that was just completely wiped away. Uh, this is up in uh, Ocean Terrace again. Huge houses just taken down. Blocks. I'll show you, I'll show, I have before and after two uh, photos that I'll show you in a little bit too. There's, there's the year, that I guess when it happened, I have five years later. And you'll see an area like this, you can't even identify what, what it's like now because there's all houses there. So these are all those small houses, gone. 700 square foot houses, gone. We saw flags everywhere, American flags. Whoever came back, you know, people would sneak in or whatever it is. We had problems with looters. We had all kinds of issues, you know, as if it wasn't bad enough. We had people stealing stuff out of people's houses. We had a, con a, a, a town worker who was stripping houses of metal, and they got copper wire out of the house. They arrested him, lost his job. Greed. Now, remember that lifeguard headquarters that I was on top of with that video? Right here is where that building was. Gone, bless you. And you can look out, and again, this is one, that, that first picture that I had up there, it says it was all beautiful, this is that day that I took it. It was just gorgeous. Again, there's a flag. That's the floor of that building. So this was up in the air, probably about this high, on top of dunes, that was fortified enough to sustain a category two or three hurricane, and it dropped. Uh, this is a bank in, in Ortley Beach. Uh, you can see on the right side of the photo. Water was eight feet there. We went in to, uh, to get the money out of the bank with uh, bank personnel and whatnot, and you can see the water line about a foot from the ceiling, the nine-foot ceilings. And we're all like, you know, they're all grabbing the money, and we're like, oh, my God. You know, it's just amazing. Right around here, this is Fielder Avenue. What's at the end of the Fielder Avenue? Those dunes that I witnessed break through, that breach. The other problem we had was while the water was still on, you'd get a break. What happens when you get a water break? It undermines everything. So now this is a water break. So not only were we kicked by waves, by normal flooding, or abnormal flooding, however you want to see it, um, you had gas issues, and then you had a lot of these water mains going. So you had just all this stuff going on at once. We had no clue. We were in a building. We are just kind of sitting there twiddling our thumbs trying to make sure our Alzheimer's patient wasn't walking out and swimming away from us. Again, this is about two blocks. This is one of those before and after pictures that I'll show you in a little bit. So you can see this telephone pole right here. That's another street. So I'm on a street. I actually had a hard time finding this five years later photo because I couldn't believe uh, how much had changed. Uh, so I'm on a road. Mouse is being difficult. I'm on a road. There's a road here. That's the back of a house. And just in front of that is another road. So all this is gone, decimated. This is really where the, 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 that impact is, where that, that's, that breach occurred, where those dunes were. That's where it all started. There's another side street wiped away. This is Vision Beach. Um, this is just south of uh, maybe five, six blocks from where that breach occurred. Sand everywhere. What do you do with that? You know, people had water through that. This guy had everything, you know. You can see, it's very difficult to see, but right here, there's a wall. And on the other side is a very fortified dune. The other side had that too, but way up over here is where that breach occurred, and it just slowly eroded everything. And I guess at that point, the tide had subsided a little bit, storm you know, was slowing down a little bit. Just total destruction. Now what we didn't realize is, well, we go back, we want to see the ocean, right? And let's see what happened to the ocean. That's where all the damage is, right? This is the bay side. So you had all undermining the air going on. That really, I mean, this is a few days later, like I said, and we were like, oh, my God, I can't believe all this damage here. This here, this was all parking lot right here. All that's gone. That's from that water going in, just eroding it out. It 
just amazing power, you know, by the storm. Um, this is right here. Right here is where that breach was. So right around here is where that, that lifeguard headquarters was. There was a house here. You can see all these, these foundations that they used to build their houses on. They still do, and they just put them on stilts now. This is Vision Beach. And you can just see all the water here. Right up here is where that marina is, the Cranberry Inlet Marina. So look how far it is from what that inlet was and what breached. And you can see the other side of our town. So now the dynamic that happened here was there was no big wave. It was this buildup. So like I said, the, the bay was more or less empty of that day. It was very low. The way the winds were going, it was kind of pushing initially the water out. Storm started brewing. It was really starting to push that water in. And if you've ever taken a boogie board, everybody knows what a boogie board is, right? Now I got kids, so I'll sit there on the boogie board and I'll grab the boogie board and slowly do this and the waves get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? That's what was occurring. These waves were just pounding the ever-living hell out of these houses. The waves were just slamming into the dunes, slamming, destroying all this, slamming into these houses, pushing all these houses down. Look at them all. There's a whole bunch here. Once that breach occurred, that water flew across the roadway, went right into that bay, filled that bay up really, really fast, and then where does the water go? Now the ocean's high tide. Can't go that way. So you've got sewers backing up because they're off now. So water's coming up from the sewers. You got water coming in from the ocean that's slamming into this dune system, slamming into these houses, pushing over to the bay, and then it's going over the mainland. So we didn't expect all the damage over there. These are all lagoons. And then beyond that is rivers. So it just gradually just filled everything up and everything just flooded. Power outages we had, we had most of the town was out of power. So now we have a whole bunch of cops out there directing traffic for the idiots out there driving around, seeing what's going on. And uh, we ended up having to, we put a roadblock here. We had roadblocks on the mainland and we just had to restrict people. And people didn't understand. I mean, Bill can attest to this too. You didn't understand the amount of damage that was done over there. We're trying to explain to people, but without really being able to post pictures and show people stuff, they didn't understand. They wanted to get home. And I remember the first school bus came over and I talked to a guy and I see him, he's got his, his uh, suitcase at a curb. They, they give you like 20 minutes to go inside your house and get your valuables out. That was it. You know, your, any money, jewelry, whatever, so people had weapons, you know, people have weapons. So they had to get their weapons out and secure them. And I see this poor guy, he's got a briefcase or a, a suitcase. And that was what he had left. That was it. And I said, did you expect this? He goes, no. I said, did you think it was this bad? He goes, no. I said, now you understand why we're trying to keep you blessed. It's for safety. Because we had sinkholes. We, still, we had all kinds of radar. They were putting these, these uh, big flat things, radar uh, readers or whatever it is, on the backs of trucks, and they were riding up and down the roads to make sure there were no sinkholes, to make sure it was safe to bring people over. So we couldn't just let people come over. And he says, no, I didn't. He says, now I understand. I said, pass it around. Because we did get a little bit of guff for not letting people over. And it got out. You know, once people saw what was really going on, um, they, they understood. Again, this is another breach. This is even the, the uh, Manilukan Bridge breach. There was tons of these. Island Beach State Park, very much like uh, the south end of Plum Island, where it's all naturalized down there. Same sort of thing. That's the bridge. So I can almost guarantee you, when we saw those three-foot white caps, that was probably gone already. So it's kind of a blessing that we saw those three-foot white caps made us turn us around because we could have been stuck in a, a worse situation. Again, Seaside Heights, you can see the pier, half of it destroyed. It's now shorter. They did rebuild, of course, because it's money. Um, a few weeks later, they dismantled the, uh, the roller coaster. In fact, I remember, I don't know if you guys remember, there was a guy that climbed the roller coaster, put a flag up there. Uh, seaside. Um, so now five years later, what do we do when we have a big destru destruction, destructive force come through, right? Build it, big, build it bigger and better, right? These are your before and afters. This is Vision Beach. Look at all the little houses on the top. They were there a few days after the storm, 
and look at the 2,800 3,000 square foot houses that are now up on stilts. Uh, to get insurance, you have to have your house on a stilt, but for the most part, these are all secondary homes. So to get a loan, you have to have the insurance, and you have to put it on stilts. If you have cash, I honestly don't know if you can just build a house however you want, because it's going against you. Um, up in Manilokin, uh, in Manilokin Township, they have these houses that are about $6 million worth of house. If it's your primary residence, you only get $250,000 back. Why have insurance? Let's build another one. There's where that house is in the middle of the road. This is where that eight feet of water was. Again, same thing here. But you can even see, look, look at the houses. Things have changed. Some are gone, some are bigger. I mean, you have houses here now. That was all destruction. That bottom picture, all those houses weren't even there. Just that one, that blue-gray one there. And there's one going up at the end. This hasn't changed much. Again, there's swaths of land. As soon as the storm came through, everybody said, oh, I want out of here. You had houses out of there for generations. You know, great-great-grandfather's houses, whatever, from the 50s, 40s, or whatever it is. And now it's owned by the family, but they can't afford either to rebuild the taxes, whatever it is, or there's infighting. There's, there's a, tons of reasons why people wouldn't rebuild. Many walked away. You know, the people that rebuilt immediately had $250,000 in their pocket that they could build a house on. Because trying to secure loans now, these days, as opposed to before the bubble hit too, it's much more difficult to get a loan. So you had people from New York, North Jersey, picking up these houses or these lots at a steal, sit on them in a few years, and this is what we say. This is that picture I was telling you about. Remember that was about two streets over, all those houses gone? I literally walked down the street three times. I'm like, this can't be. I can't even see that house as a reference point. But this is the exact same location looking across to where those houses were, where they got destroyed. So you can see the landscape. Look how big these houses are. There's the new building. That's where the old one was. Again, building, building, building. We saw a pivotal mark probably around a three-year mark of when things were really starting to recover a little bit. Uh, this past year, we really kind of hit that kind of midpoint. And we're really moving ahead. Probably another three, two, three years, we should have everything pretty much rebuilt and back up to snuff again. But again, they had to rebuild everything. We had federal government came in and, and they put lines in. And we actually have copper wire. A lot of them is aluminum, the old wire. It's all copper wire. Couldn't imagine how much that cost. But they did it right. Aluminum, salt, um, the infrastructure's all new. That's gone. Again, this is just north of the Surf Club. Surf Club is just to the right of that brown building. There's actually that, that empty spot there on the left side. This guy that has an RV, so summertime, that's his property still. So he'll set up shop, puts his RV there. That's his private beach. Uh, the condos on the left side, the top one, they, they had to take down. And they built bigger and better, higher, more expensive, I'm sure. Uh, you can see the lifeguard headquarters down at the end there. Oh, sorry. Quick fingers. Um, you see that building now? So that's even higher. It is, it's, it's a lot, structurally, it's a lot more stronger than the other one. I mean, the other one had a fireplace and it had old bricks and stuff, you know. It was just an old house. Fifth Avenue. And there's a house there now, big house. There's the beach. There's Fourth Avenue. There's like, what, two, three feet of sand there at least. And you can see... My mouse is here. There's a big house there now. There's here. See all these houses? All jacked up. Higher, stronger. Water go under. It's a barrier island. The name in itself is, is what it is. You know, it's a sand dune. But people will still build on it. This is looking north. 
Uh, some of the houses are gone. It was very, actually, very difficult to take this picture because now I, you can't stand on the dunes, which I'm still, you know, I could probably not get arrested, but I wasn't going to stand on the dunes. I was trying to get my best picture that I could. Um, but this was pretty wild, seeing all these houses when that storm first struck and how high they are. You know, now you, now you understand why they put these 50, 60 foot, 100 foot, whatever it is, these, these really long posts in, you know, driving those things in the sand. This is why. This is Ocean Beach 3 again. You can see the top photo, a lot of those houses got destroyed. Now they're all pretty little ducks in a row there. Fortified the beach a bit. Again, some bigger, taller, better houses. This is Pelican Island. So when you go over the bridge, this is Pelican Island where all those telephone poles were, this is looking just east of that. And that was all underwater there. This is one of the side streets. I think this is Fielder as well. Or this might be Fort. This is a couple streets over. Thank God that tree was there because it's, it's hard to, that tree in that house, it was the only way I could, I could discern where I was. Mia's Pizza, good please, good pizza if you're ever in Norton Beach on the Bayside. They have a nice parking lot there now. Brand new house. This I had a little bit of a hard time because now that's the house that was there, which is now hidden by this house and that house. So I have duplexes in. Man Looking Bridge. I remember when Bill, Bill was out with me, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed because I, I love the expression on his face going, oh my God, you know, you, you don't normally get that from people and it was, it was pretty cool. But when we were on the bridge this day, when I took him down, there was a state worker and he was checking markers in the water and stuff like that and he was telling us how some of the markers floated away. He says, I'd love to see some pictures of that. I'm like, oh, this is what that was. And the guy's jaw dropped. He was amazed to see how much, you know, how different it was. Uh, one of the other side stories I want to take away from this, too, is, you know, FEMA was on the ground. They were there quick. There's goods and bads about FEMA. Uh, I remember months later sitting in a parking lot not far from where that big life heart guard headquarters was. And I'm sitting in my car, having my coffee, just keeping an eye on things, not much going on. They were starting to rebuild the big parking lots there, so it was kind of like that packed gravel base. And I see these two guys walking down the road come up to me and they're like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, what are, you, what are you guys doing here? You work for FEMA? Yeah, you know, we're from FEMA. We're out from Missouri. You know, they, they didn't really have a clue. Nobody really briefed them on what was going on. Again, this is months later. So uh, he says, what was over here? I said, oh, well, there was a parking lot here. He says, oh, well, what about over there? I said, oh, behind the church? He goes, what church? I said, exactly. And that house and that building, the lifeguard headquarters. And the guy's like, oh, my God. He, he didn't have a clue, really, what was going on. You know, not to bash them again, but... You know, you, when you're dealing with the federal government, obviously a trickle-down effect, you, you talk to locals to find out where you're at and where things are. And he had an eye-opener uh, when I talked with him. Again, this is Lavalette. This is, remember that beautiful morning picture that I took? That was what I woke up to on the top, and that's the parking lot, roadway, everything they drove over to get, get to us. Again, the roadway. See how high the water was. My thoughts, I kind of told you a little bit of what I thought um, on how this storm really impacted us, how the dynamic was behind it, that slamming of these waves into those dunes and just slowly destroying things. That's what happened. Uh, our town was really prepared for it, believe it or not. I mean, we got pretty creative. Uh, we used front-end loaders to save people, getting in the buckets. Um, we used school buses to close off a lot of the uh, intersections for Route 37 because we just didn't have enough personnel. You know, we, we had to be out there helping people and saving people and, and dealing with more extreme emergencies other than directing, directing traffic. So it was difficult for people for a while. We closed off a lot of intersections. You have to go down three, four lights to turn around. So we put these school buses right in the middle of the roadway and force them to go. According to the Army Corps of Engineers, Superstorm Sandy removed 12 million cubic yards of sand from New Jersey alone. Uh, that's about a million truckloads of sand is gone. Uh, I have some photos, if we have time, of the replenishment program that's going on right now. Basically, in a nutshell, they, over the, the spring, they added about 150 feet of uh, beach to Orly Beach. 
The ultimate end to this is supposed to be, uh, again, this is Army Corps, 150-foot uh, wide dunes and 250-foot wide beach. We've never had that. I don't remember ever in my life having a big beach like that, you know. Um, just amazing. So with that, is there any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, water sewer system was completely destroyed. Yes, sir. Uh, Here. What do you mean by that? You won't hear it, but I do. To, uh, so. He's asking uh, about the sewer system and how it was completely destroyed. Uh, basically what happened was when they turned off the electric, obviously, that caused problems with the pumps. So all the pumps were off. They were backup. Only one worked. So now you have this undermining, you have the sinkholes, uh, you have all this salt water now backing up into these pipes. The gas lines had to be replaced because now you have corrosive material inside of them. So they weren't like physically destroyed, but there was a lot of sand, so they couldn't be flushed. That was basically the gist of it. They tried to flush as much as they could, um, but obviously you have that much sand and salt water going through these pipes, they just had to replace them. That answer your question? Yes, sir. Do you think there'd be a way of um, preparing ahead of time, like just shutting down water and sewer and capping it somewhere and even shutting off electricity? I mean, it, you could have had explosions with gas pipes, you know. Oh, we did. We did. We, we did shut off the electric. They, at the bridge, there's main lines that go over the bridge. So they did shut off the electric there. They did shut off the gas. The strange thing is, I don't know if there were generators over there or somehow there was some kind of residual electric coming in from the north. That down line that I was sitting on that was live, the power was cut off at that point already. And it's in foam steaming up. So I don't understand how, how again, I'm not a scientific guy, I'm not an engineer guy, I'm not a, you know, a, a electric guy. Uh, I don't understand how that kind of backed up uh, into, into the grid. Uh, again, now you have solar, right? You got people with generators. A lot of people have generators nowadays. How do you control that? You know, I, I really don't. I don't know. But they did everything that they could. Yes, ma'am. What was the percentage of year-rounders on the island compared to the total population? Year-rounders. The percentage of year-rounders on the island. Uh, for the most part, you had it was all seasonal. You have a handful of people. It wasn't really. I can't even give you a number or percentage, but it's a low percentage of people. Not a lot of people live over there. Mostly summer, yes. So you had, a, again, you had a lot of these small salt box sort of houses that would come and crash or rent out for a few thousand hours a, a week, and they'd come and have their grand old time on the beach at the Jersey Shore and have a great time. Um, Percentage-wise, I, I really don't know, but we didn't have a lot of people. Lavalette, on the other hand, has a lot of full-time people. So that's what we were dealing with because we were stuck with Lavalette. Uh, Orly Beach, we didn't have many people that were really stuck. Uh, we had a handful of people here and there, but that was really it. Even up in Normandy, it wasn't a lot. Oh, it was mandatory, but I don't want to leave. And people didn't, and then they were stuck. Even in Green Island, that was the, the uh, western portion of that bay area that I was showing before uh, on the other side of the bay. There were people driving. We were getting calls. They were driving down the road, and the water was coming so fast. Their, their car was moving around by, by water, like a toy, like I said before, with that two-and-a-half-ton uh, vehicle. What do you do? We couldn't do anything. We did our best. Uh, could have we had done it better? We learned. Yeah, yeah, we learned. Yes, ma'am. Joseph Huey River apologized to you for sending you out there. Uh, yes, my supervisor did uh, apologize to me and to my wife um, at a dinner one night. Actually, he apologized to me earlier. Um, again, a good guy, but I honestly think he was uh, just just taken aback by the whole storm. He, he had a lot on his hands, you know, so I can't really fault him a whole lot, but again, I'm a seasoned guy. I know it's getting bad. Y you might want to listen to me. Um, well, it is what it is. What am, what am I going to do, you know? Uh, I can't keep harping on it. Uh, about a week and a half later, I'll just point on this too, we had a snowstorm. So we had probably about 60 to 80% of the power back. Lights were working, school buses were going back, everybody's getting back to their thing, you know. We get this heavy, wet rainstorm. And I'm on the beach, and they were expecting breaches because, again, now we have no dunes, there's nothing there. Any high tide could have taken us out again. And I made the suggestion that we're not staying this time, are we? 
And they said, no, I, I, think, I think Chris is good on this one. So we left. And it happened to be my birthday, ironically. So I remember uh, we had power at our house. We were staying with my parents, thank God. So they had power throughout the whole storm. We lost power for nine days. Uh, I remember leaving early. I'm like, listen, can I go home? It's my birthday. My daughter's birthday was a few days ago. I got to move my, my family back into my house. They're like, go ahead. What are they going to do? So I go to my parents' house. I'm loading up the, call, the car. My wife was at work. She's a teacher in, in a neighboring town that didn't get hit as bad. And she says, we're moving home tonight, right? I said, yeah, well, I'm packing right now. She's like, you are? I'm like, yeah, we're going home tonight. We go home. There's a, a main road that's Oak Ridge Parkway. It's a residential area that goes up to 37. On the other side of 37 is Lakehurst Road, which is what we live off of. It's pitch black. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, all my neighbors said, oh, we got power. We crossed 37, we had power. So we're home, what, maybe an hour, hour and a half? My parents call, guess what, we lost power. <laughs> I said, bring your food over. I don't have any food. So, uh, but that was a, a kick in the rear end. You know, the, the, we were up to that 60 to 80% of all our power being back. And because it was such a wet, heavy snow, school buses came back out. We had to block off roads. We were set back about three, four days. Go ahead, sir. I'll get to you in a second. You've gone to Plum Island when it was, assuming it was daylight, and and you and you know that we're a few miles up the river here, downtown is two blocks away, block and a half. Do you have any sense or any way you could describe what a Sandy-like event would do to downtown Newburyport? Would it would the would the surge reach us? <laughs> so he's asking a question in regards to Plum Island and how that might affect a sandy sort of storm coming through and affect the downtown area of, of Newburyport, correct? Right here. Right here. Uh, again, I was fortunate enough to take a, a very guided, well-guided trip today with, with Sandy, and she explained to me about the secondary dune system that's there. That really isn't the secondary dune system, it seems, anymore. That is the primary dune system. And then there's a nice gully in that area. Where's that water going to go? I told you exactly where it was going to go before when I showed you when I saw that breach. As soon as that dune breaks through, it's just going to erode and go straight through. Whatever's across that. I mean, it's a unique situation. I kind of got an idea of, of the geography of the area. You got a lot going on here. You know, I hear there's constant flooding downtown when you get a, a nor'easter or a, a, the king tides, which I never knew what a king tide was before. You know, I thought it was some kind of detergent that you used that worked really well. But um, so, so as we went through our, our few hours together today, I'm looking, I'm like, this could be a really bad scenario. You know, between the jetty and the sand going through the jetty now and the sand getting stuck on one side of the jetty and it should be going on the other side. You know, again, I'm not an engineer. I don't know what the Army Corps is going to end up doing. Uh, I know what they've done. Uh, from what I understand, it, it, is it working? It doesn't seem to be, you know. Mother Nature has a memory, just like those, those inlets. Water has a way of getting through. It will remember. Mother Nature is beautiful. She's annoying, and she could be really mean, you know. So it's, it's not really a, a point of, of, is this going to happen? It's going to happen. It's just when and where. You know, high, tides are rising, global warming, everything. It's just going to get worse. And those beautiful houses that are going up on Plum Island, gorgeous. I wouldn't want to move there. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes. Um, I just have a question. You said that you witnessed the sand barriers, like how the water was pouring right through them, like completely knocked them down. How effective, like, do you think they are? Like, what's your opinion? Like, they just went and went to rebuild them. Do you think that's, like, a bad idea? Like... Do you think that it actually prevented a lot from this? For putting the extra dunes up there? Yeah. It has in the past. So she's asking a question in regards to uh, how the dunes that were in place and the emergency dunes were in place during the storm, uh, were they effective? They are effective to a point, but, you know, the 28th, look what they were doing on the 28th, a day earlier, and they were getting beat up. It's the typical response to, hey, we're getting a nor'easter, get the trucks out there, put the sand up, all right, you know, make sure it's all packed in good. And what happens? Half the dune goes away, and what goes out of our pocket? Money. Because it costs a lot of money to keep doing this. Again, it's a barrier island. The name itself, it's a sand dune. So instead of sort of regressing back and saying, you know what, maybe we should take this back and not build anymore. 
bigger, better houses. That's what's going up now. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's working anyway. That's okay. Uh, it seemed like it was different to you. Was, was that a clue to you in any way that this was going to be a really different kind of storm? Well, you know, it's funny. On the 29th, a week and a half ago, we had a smaller scale of Sandy occur, really. Cold front coming in from the west. I'm not a meteorologist. I like to watch, right? Drives them nuts. Um, Nor'easter coming up the coast. What was Sandy at that point? A hurricane. And I remember telling my wife that morning, she goes, do you think it's going to be bad? And I used an expletive. But I said, yeah, it's up in Wisconsin. It's down in Florida. It, this is just, I've never seen a dynamic of a storm like this before. I don't think a lot of people did. And it really, people were underestimated by this. You saw the storm sort of brewing out there. Ah, maybe we'll get a hurricane, might be category one. And all of a sudden, like, ah, looking at these models and the euro and all this other stuff. And all of a sudden, like, like two, three days before, oh, God, this is not good. And then it was this you know, flurry of activity. Everybody worried what was going to go on. Put the dunes up, build everything up. You know, it was, it was that quick. It was amazing how fast this storm really blew up. And that's kind of what happened last week with the storm. I and mean, we, we lost power for 11 hours. It was rain, we had wind, you know, there were a lot of limbs down. And it was, like I said, at least this time I told my wife, I said, well, at least this time I'm home, you know. Uh, and I had, I went down, got the boxes of the LED headlights, the kids were having a blast with their headlights on, running around the house, and I had candles. The fire alarms got set off because I put the candles on, so now I'm taking all the fire alarms off. We, we were fine. It was warm. But again, five years later, on the 29th, we get another storm like that. It's happening more frequently. Look, look at the hurricanes. I mean, this season was amazing. Thank God we weren't, you know, really involved in that. But these poor people, these storms are getting stronger and stronger. Category fives in that succession? Unbelievable. Yes, ma'am. Well, I wouldn't be in a patrol car, I can tell you that much. <laughs> I'd be at home. Uh, she, she wanted to know uh, if we could do anything different. Right? Will we do anything differently now, knowing a storm like this was coming up the coast? Uh, I think we would have been prepared in regards to, we kind of, you know, being in emergency uh, services, you learn to adapt. And you take account for everything you have. Everything. I mean, we use school buses. We had shelters in place. We had, we had a number of things going on. We obviously underestimated the strength of this storm and what it was going to do, not only just to the beach. Ah, the beach is going to get hammered. You know, there's going to be some issues over there. The mainland, we had no clue about that at all. You know, uh, what could we do? Maybe have things a little bit more organized. We learned from what we went through. Um, we put out newspaper, radio, TV, everything about this storm. Every, inf every bit of information that we could for this storm, put it out still slammed us. You know, uh, something this magnitude, how can you prepare for, you know, 70 to 80 percent of your, your town being without power at one time? You know, the trees down. Uh, vehicles, uh, might have been a little bit smarter with vehicles. Cops on the beach, might have thought twice about that one. Um, but you can only be so prepared. You know, you, you learn from your mistakes, take notes, you know, luckily the guy we have in ROEMs, he's, he's aces, um, Paul Daly, he handled it amazingly. Um, I couldn't ask for another person, really. And uh, I know he's learned a lot and he's shared his wealth of information, what we went through through various communities down in Florida, South Carolina, and they've learned from him, unfortunately, through what we went through. But, you know, part of what you do is educational, and that's what it was. Yes, ma'am. Preparedness. Um, were you guys prepared? Uh, did you have evacuation plans in place that were well thought out? Did we have evacuation plans that were well thought out in place? Correct. Right. Well, again, we, we did notify on radio. I mean, other than going door to door, and you know, we have around 100,000 people. 
Um, the beach community, like I said before, basically is not really populated by us in our town anyway. So we were pretty good there. Again, the big surprise was over on the mainland. That cold cocked us. We had no clue about it being that bad. I mean, the whole downtown area was flooded. We lost fire trucks. We lost all kinds of apparatus. Um, and it was the speed of this that really took us. You know, at least if something's slowly rising, all right, go back, you know, move the fire trucks to a higher ground, whatever it was. I mean, we, we moved equipment here and there, but it came in so fast. You couldn't. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Well, I don't think our infrastructure is designed for mass evacuations. Look at Rathbun, Florida. They, they couldn't get out of there. They left the Pentagon. No. We're, we're lucky uh, in our town. We have Route 37. So we have a number of main thoroughfares. You have Route 9 that goes north-south. You have Route 70 and Route 37 that basically goes east-west. You have Route 35, which is on Barrier Island. Probably not the best place to go for when you're trying to evacuate out of there. Um, Garden State Parkway. So we have a lot of main arteries that we use. Fisher Boulevard, Hooper Avenue, two three-lane highways. Um, so we are pretty fortunate to have a number of arteries to get people moving and out of there, um, you know, especially one way. You know, nobody's going east anymore. Everybody's going west. Um, you know, we would have sent people out west, Manchester. You know, the worst that they really had was, would you have like three days of power out, huh? Yeah. Right? And they were back in business. So we didn't have school for two weeks. Two weeks, no school. And even then they were scraping to try and get things going. So now the schools have generators. Yeah, everything, everybody's got a generator now, which is great. Um, so we're more prepared in that aspect. Um, in regards to the pumps before that, that other gentleman uh, had brought up in the sewer system, now they have backup, backup, backups. They put in a whole new pump system. It, it, it's a high-end, good system that's in place now um, that can be fully submerged and still work. Um, so that kind of complicated things a little bit when that went down. But so. Yes, Sandy. After today, So, so basically, Sandy's saying that um, based on my experience today in Plum Island, what would be my suggestion on what I went through for this area, you know, how to combat this? I mean, Newburyport, as we're riding around, like, you, like I said, you've got a lot going on. You have a lot of full-time people here. Um, you have a lot of water liabilities. I mean, as much as you have that marsh, which is designed to kind of take that sort of brute force, your dune system's the problem. That's where it starts. If you can keep that and not get the water in there, you're golden. The problem is, what I saw today and what it had been three, four months ago, a year ago, two years ago, I was astonished. You know, that's where the focus should really be. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a money issue. It should be about doing the right thing, really. You know, because, you know, you have, especially like by us, like I said before, you have these houses, $6 million houses right here. And I'm not going to put my dune system in there. I'm not going to have the Army Corps because I want to be able to walk out my kitchen and go out onto my beach. But what about the poor guy across the road that spent his life savings on a three, $400,000 house and moves there full time? And you've got this guy who's got two houses, probably one in Florida, you know, he's a transient, and he's not there all the time, and he doesn't care. That was part of the problem. We had a lot of people that were holdouts in regards to the Army Corps coming in. You know, whether that's the right answer or not, I don't know. Again, I've, I've expressed before, it's a sand dune. It's a barrier island. We shouldn't be building on it. My theory is if it's knocked down, keep it knocked down. Don't build bigger. Don't build higher. You know, build higher. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's part of the problem. You've got people with a lot of money that can do whatever they want. And it's, it's a shame. It should be, you know, look what we've, we've been going through, humanity, right? should be about doing the right thing. Not for me, the right thing. And that's what's getting in the way. Anyone else? I want to thank uh, Sandy. Sandy, like I said, I've known for, for 21 years. I'll remind you again. And, uh, you know, for her putting me in, in contact with Bill, Bill, I'm glad I was able, where's Bill? Okay. 
Bill, he can see this on video later on. Uh, I really enjoyed my time with Bill and, and Don, uh, showing them around and literally going, you know, like I said, this is what happened here. And uh, again, thank you for Sh Sheila uh, for, for putting this all together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.